Welcome to the talk. Yeah. The talk is going to be about prototyping today and doing that using web tech as well as Juice and C++ and how to integrate the two. So, as I said, my name is Arthur Karabot and I work at Output. Output is a music company. We make plugins. Check, check. Great, we'll begin that again. So, welcome to the presentation. We're going to be talking a lot about prototyping today. Just to give you a little bit of background on this, I, as you heard, I'm a UX engineer working at Output. So Output is a music company. We make software plugins and effects, as well as making studio equipment. So desks, speaker stands, side carts, and even monitors. So my job at Output is a UX engineer which means that I'm somewhere in between design and development. I often work with software in its sort of early formative stages, trying to figure out what something is going to be when it grows up. Before I started working at Output, I was a bit more of an unusual sort of interaction designer for music projects. So this augmented reality music app with the fantastic composer Anna Meredith, and this interactive musical building with Asif Khan that was for the London Olympics. So this is the sort of the promise of this talk. By the end of this talk, you're going to know how to use web technologies for productive prototyping of music and audio software. We're going to be talking about four things today. First of all, prototyping, what it is, what type of prototyping I'm talking about. Secondly, why web tech? Why is this useful? Why is this a good technology for prototyping? Third, we're going to look at a case study of a real feature built into a, an output product, which is an arpeggiator that started off as a web prototype. And finally, we'll be looking at doing integrated web and C++ prototypes using web views. So prototyping. I love prototyping. It's the most fun part of the process for me. It's where you're just playing with ideas. You have an idea, you turn it into something, you figure out that it's maybe not the best idea, but you've got a new idea, and you make something from that. It's really great, and you get to avoid a lot of the chores that can be in development, such as having to make sure it works on different platforms, or different doors, or different OSs. And you still get to do some of the nerdy stuff, like refactoring things and optimization where it's needed. So prototyping, it's kind of Odging something together to try out an idea, right? And that's true, but I think there are some important principles to prototyping to keep in mind. The first is that prototyping is about communication. It is about creating a feedback loop with yourself and a feedback loop with others. You want to figure out if an idea is good. That's kind of the, the question that you have, and you want to really try it out. And it's important that you can do that with yourself, because that's a very quick process but also that you can do it with other people because you get that outside perspective and so you're not too buried and lost in the weeds with it. The second thing that's really important about prototyping is cost. And what do I mean by cost? I mean both time and money because in an ideal world, we could just have a fully formed product and try it out and see if it was good, but that takes a lot of time and money to do. So instead, you want to do sort of effective trying out little bits of the idea, the bits that are the highest risk or the, the least certain. But the other thing about cost is motivation and creativity. If something is a real chore to build, you're going to build less of them. You're going to try out less ideas. It's going to slow you down, and it's going to feel like drudge work. And that costs you in terms of your motivation. It can be really boring uh, to go through a few bad ideas and really demoralizing and that's going to stop you from pushing through and finding the newer ones. So what do these two principles have in common? Speed. Reducing the latency between your idea and trying it out is going to really help, both in terms of communicating, communicating your idea to yourself, but also to other people. It can be really painful if you say, well, that's a good point, but let me have a week to implement it. And what I'm not talking about here is getting stressed out and trying to work faster, but just trying to cut out some of the slowness of software development. So this is kind of the thesis of the talk here. 
that if you can decrease the iteration time of your prototyping, you're going to increase the quality of your creations. You're going to be able to better communicate your ideas and you're going to get to try out more of them. So what kind of prototypes am I talking about? I'm going to use this term look and feel prototypes. This is from a great paper called What Do Prototypes Prototype? And a look and feel prototype is checking out and trying to investigate what it will be like to use something before it's fully built. And in this case today, I'm going to be talking about building interactive software prototypes, not just visual ones or um, paper prototypes, for example. And this term comes from this paper that I mentioned, where they define this sort of three-dimensional space for prototypes. So you have look and feel there in the bottom right, which is what will the experience of using this thing be? But you also have role prototypes. And a role prototype is how will this be useful to someone? How would they use this in their lives? Sometimes we already know that. If you are building, let's say, a new compressor or an arpeggiator, you sort of know what role that places that thing is going to be in people's lives. It's going to create arpeggios from the notes that they're playing. And then you also have implementation prototypes, which is checking out and spiking on how it will work. This is a bit more of an engineering thing, and you're going, well, there's some unknown here, there's some technology that we need to figure out, so let's do one to throw away at the beginning. Now, these aren't mutually exclusive, and by creating a look and feel prototype, as you'll see, you inevitably do a little bit of implementation and role prototyping. Something else I want to point out before we really get into it is even though I'm talking about web tech today, I'm not saying that web tech is the be all and end all for prototyping. You need different tools for different stages. Most of my work starts with pen and paper or an iPad, just sketching things by hand, because that can be the quickest way, the cheapest way to try out an idea and just see it in front of me. Also, the type of things that I'm talking about prototyping today are along the lines of product design, interaction design, workflows, and UI. What will a product be? What will it look like to use it? How will the user interact with this thing? And most of that, or a lot of that, is in the user interface. What I'm not talking about is prototyping DSP. If you're prototyping DSP, you're more likely to use one of these great tools. And uh, they're, they're fantastic, and that's what they're really well suited for. That's not to say that you can't do DSP in the browser these days. This is a live coding DSP playground that I built where you can do sample level DSP and refresh the page immediately, refresh the code immediately, and hear the results. But really, those other tools are more powerful and have greater libraries to leverage. Just before we move on from prototyping, I'm going to give you just a couple of references which are really great resources. All of these, by the way, are going to be linked at the end on a web page. The first one is Marek Bereza's talk at ADC a couple of years ago, which was called How to Prototype Audio Software. Very strongly recommended. The middle one is the paper that I mentioned before, What the Prototypes Prototype, which is written by a couple of researchers at Apple in the 90s, but is still very relevant today. And the third is the work of Brett Victor, in particular this talk, Inventing on Principle which, while not specifically about prototyping, it is about tight feedback loops and having an immediate view of the idea that you're working with. And in that presentation, he has some fantastic examples of prototypes. So why web technologies? Why are they particularly suited for prototyping? Well, there are three things that are going to make your prototyping effective. The first is you your skills, your talent, your abilities, the craft that you've built up. So there's no real secret here. Be good. The good news is, if you're here at ADC taking your time to learn more, or you're watching this later on YouTube, you're already good. You have the most important thing, which is to be interested in getting better at this. So let's talk about some of the things where I can give you some more practical advice. The second is the values of your tools. So what do I mean by values? Well, it's the things that they prioritize or deprioritize, the things that they're good at or that they are not really interested in. So C++, for example, it highly values runtime speed, and it values it more than compilation speed. 
And I'm not going to go too far down this rabbit hole, but I do think it's really important to consider the tools and the languages that you're using, because not only do they have an effect on the thing that you make, but they have an effect on the ideas that you can even have. So why are the values of web tech really good for prototyping? Well, I think they kind of live in the middle of these two worlds. On the left, we have C++ and Juice, and these are great tools for building robust production, fast performance software, but their iteration time is slow, and it's harder to share something that you build in them. You have to create an executable and upload it somewhere. And then on the right, we have these graphic design tools, these visual tools that often have prototyping features, so Figma, Sketch, and Framer here. The thing is that they're really great for defining graphics, but they're not that good at defining behavior. If we really want to be defining behavior and interaction design of a complex piece of software, the types of things that we all work on, web really works well because you have access to a full and powerful programming language. Also, the web was created at the beginning to display documents. And that means that we have very powerful tools for creating GUIs now. The other fundamental feature or value of web tech is sharing. The whole point of the web was to link together documents and be able to share them. Additionally, the iteration time in web tech is very fast because you can just save something and the page refreshes and you can try it immediately. So what do I mean by fast? Well, I'm just going to give you a quick demonstration here. Let's build a simple UI to just control a couple of parameters. At the top, we've got this type definition, so each parameter has a name, a value, a min and a max, etc. And then in our application, we have our state, which is just an array of those parameters, and this function which returns the UI. So let's create a piece of UI for each parameter. I'm going to map this array of parameters to just the names. Now we can see they're both on the same line, so I'm going to give them their own HTML element. Now they're on separate lines. In fact, I'm going to use a header for the name, and I'm also going to display the current value. So now we need a control to be able to change the value of each parameter. I'm going to add a slider here and initialize it with the parameter's values. We can see it's already got the default value, but moving it doesn't do anything. So let's add an event handler. So every time we get an input event, we just update the parameter's value. Great, that works nicely. Let's add a new feature, which is the history of the parameter. So I update my type, and I add the new field to the model. And every time we get an input event, before we update the value, we push the current value into the history. Let's prove that that's working. I'm just going to print out the values of the entire history. So that works, but it's not a great way to view the data. Let's visualize it instead using the Canvas API. So I create a Canvas element, give it a width of 200 and a height of 100, and then I'm just going to draw a white rectangle for the background. So now to visualize that data, I'm just going to add a black dot, which is going to represent each data point in the history. You can see that in the top left corner. And now I'm going to map each value in the history to one of those points. So now I need to map the x and y coordinate of each point. So the x is going to take the index of the data point, and we're going to map that from 0 to the length of our history up to our width. For the y, I'm going to take the actual value, which will go from the parameter minimum to the parameter maximum, and that will go when it's at the minimum, it should be at the bottom, and when it's at the max, it should be at the top. Now I'm just going to get rid of the text history, and look at that, we have a nice new history feature. So those are the kind of iteration times that I'm talking about. Now, obviously, when you're working, there might be a lot more thinking. This was quite a simple problem to solve. But you really want to be cutting down any time between idea and trying it out. 
And to be honest, even this can feel slow. What would be great is if we could prototype at the speed of thought. We're not quite there yet. So now, the other great value of WebTech that I mentioned is sharing. I once worked with this programming language, languages researcher, Alex Worth, who had started doing all of his language research in JavaScript, so building new languages implemented in JavaScript as sort of the assembly language of the web. And his reason for that was very simple. He found that if he sent people an executable of a compiler, they never opened it. But if he sends them a link, they have no excuse. So this is something that I do at work. I have an internal web page which has all the prototypes on it. I can just send that link to people. It means they always have the latest version, and it's really easy for them, for them to try them out. Now, the third thing that is going to make your prototyping effective is the things that you have to leverage. What is the, what are the, what's the existing code? What are the existing tools you have that you can use in your prototyping? So the web now has some really powerful APIs. So the web audio API for doing audio and synthesis, web MIDI for MIDI input and output, and then the canvas and WebGL for graphics. And for a real tour de force of these things all together, check out the Learning Synths project by Ableton. And for better or for worse, JavaScript has a lot of libraries. Now, it can be good to go out there and use other people's stuff, but you should also build up your own library, your own little bag of tricks of prototyping functions and helpers and things that just help you get the job done quickly. So I've been talking about using web tech for prototyping. And just a quick note here on production versus prototyping. You can actually use web for production UIs. And our CTO, Spencer, gave a great talk about this at ADC last year because a large feature in Arcade, the browser, is all built using web tech. The way I'm talking about working in this talk is slightly different. It's a different mentality. You get to cut a lot of corners, only target one browser, for example, or one OS, or one door. It's not really important that it works everywhere. It's a different type of code. But I also think there can be sometimes some advantages to using a different tool when prototyping than when in production. Because if you can't just take your existing code and let it become the production product, you can avoid some problems. So from that paper, I was saying, again, when that happens, when you take a prototype and let it become the production thing, that code might turn out to be difficult to maintain and develop. And the UI and the rest of the software may never be properly redesigned. So it can be useful to sort of build one to throw away, as Fred Brooks talked about in Mythical Man Month. I think this was really well put by friend Ahmet, who said, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary solution. So beware, beware. Right, the case study. Let's look at a real case study of a feature that was built into Arcade, which is the software instrument, a product that we build at Output. So Arcade is a sample-based instrument. And in version 1, each kit or preset was made up of 15 samples, which were placed on the white keys of the keyboard and then 10 modifiers, which are effects for those samples. We recently just shipped version 2.0, which has chromatic instruments. And for this, we wanted to add an arpeggiator. Now, each kit or preset in a chromatic instrument has up to three layers, so three samples every time you press a key. And the spec was, it's got to be for this instrument, and it's also got to have feature parity with the arpeggiators in our previous products. The other part of the brief was that this tool was primarily for our sound designers and also our power users. So we can get away with having a bit more of a complex or nerdy UI on this. So now I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of this prototype. And the way that this worked was that it was built into a web page and it used web MIDI to communicate via the IAC driver, a virtual MIDI cable in Mac OS, to Arcade running in standalone. So the, the main thing that I wanted to do with this arpeggiator was say, OK, if we have these three layers, what's something that we can do with this ARP that we wouldn't do if we were just having a single layer instrument? So here's a demonstration of it. On the left, we have the arpeggiator prototype running in a web browser. And on the right, we have Arcade, with a chromatic kit loaded. So 
this sounds like this. And it's made up of three layers. So we have this bass, and this slow attack piano, and these plucky signs. So all together one more time. So now let's check out the arpeggiator. One thing you'll notice is that in the ARP, each layer has its own sequence. Focusing on this first layer, I'm going to play a three note chord. And in this group of notes, I've got a bunch of controls. So I can change the rate and make it go faster. And I can change the number of steps, get some cool kind of phasing effect. And I have a whole bunch of other parameters. I've got the volume, I can change the length of each note, so make them all very long, or short. I can shift the octave around. And I can set the probability of whether a step should be a chord. And I also have panning and the probability of whether the step should play at all. And so the other thing I can do is have multiple of these groups of notes. So add this chunk, I'm going to make this twice as long, but twice as fast. I'm just going to randomize it, but make sure that the probabilities are all the way up. And if I turn this other layer on, I can get some cool polyphony. And for something a little more fully formed, here's one I made earlier. So that's the type of prototyping that I'm talking about. As you can see, that thing was very functional and things were roughly in the places that you'd want them, but it definitely didn't look like a finished production UI. And that's where we would move to using other tools, sort of more visual design tools. Now, the great thing about doing this demo was that what I didn't have to do was argue with people in front of a whiteboard saying, oh, we should do this complex thing with different numbers of chunks and changing note durations and multiple layers, where it could have easily gotten shot, it could have easily been shot down as too complex. But by giving a demo of something where you can just hold down one chord and get some really rich audio, really rich music, stakeholders were all convinced. And it's much more fun to build something and play with it than it is to argue in front of a whiteboard. So, once we'd reached that stage and had the prototype that we liked, we moved to doing a visual design in Figma. And this is where we start to see something that is a lot more, what, a lot more like it would, it's going to look in production. Now, the cool thing about this is that there are some questions that got raised while we're doing this design, some little bits of UI that we wanted to try out. And with those, we could just put them back into the prototype to try them out. And the good thing was, but sometimes this helped us spot design bugs. Here's an example. These buttons, which change the number of steps in each group of notes, they were placed nicely in the middle, and that looks, looks really good, right? The problem was that when you clicked them, the length of that chunk changed, and so the position of those buttons moved. And so you couldn't just go click, 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 click to add many chunks because the button would move. And once we realized that, there's a simple solution. Shift it over to the left, and the buttons stay in the same place. There were also wins when it came to implementing this thing in Juice. So something that was noticed was during the mouse interactions. That if I move the mouse very slowly across all of these steps, it works as you'd expect. 
But if I move really quickly, some of those steps get missed out. And that's because the mouse events are happening at a slower rate than the mouse is moving. So not every step is being hit. And what this made us realize is that what we actually need to do is for each mouse event, take the current step and the previous step and update all of the steps in between them. So we had a real win here by getting to avoid that bug. The other thing was that when it came to implementing the audio engine side of things, originally the estimate was pretty high, and we were uncertain that it could be built in time. But just walking through the code and looking at the model with the developer who's going to build it, she found that actually the problem was going to be slightly different. She came up with a clever way that it could be implemented, and both the estimate and the actual time to take to build it were much lower. And most importantly, the I guess the most effective thing about prototyping is that we built something that we're happy with. And this is a quote from one of our sound designers, and this is where I really just felt great about this project and felt that everything we had done to build it, even though it required more effort to do that prototyping, it was really worth it. Downsides. There are some downsides to this approach. We would have liked to have built this right into the plugin and had a web view in there to try it out, but unfortunately, Safari, which is the browser that is used by web views on Mac OS, doesn't support web MIDI. Web MIDI is currently only supported in Chrome. Now, this is the kind of problem that you often face with prototyping or even programming generally across different languages, is that you can sometimes hit these limitations of your tool. This brings me to the final section, which is talking about this type of integrated prototyping. So this is where we can take a C++ frame or, or existing product and have a web view in it in which we can display a UI. So this is a web view. A web view is just a juice component that can be placed anywhere in your UI, and it can load a web page. Web page. It uses the browser from the underlying op operating system, so Safari on Mac and then IE or Edge on Windows. Here, you can see it displaying the ADC website. Now, this is the, the class you're going to use. And this whole section is a bit more on the nitty gritty of how you implement these things. This is the Juice class you want to look up, which does a great job of providing, providing a single API for both of those platforms. And you're going to need to extend this slightly and add a form of communication between the languages, between C++ and JavaScript. I'm not going to jump into the full details here because there are a few different approaches and it kind of depends on your context. I'm going to refer you to Spencer's talk at ADC last year and also this repo built by Tom Dunkoff where he's been creating a full project which is using Juice and a web view and building synths and using that UI to control those parameters. One tool that I did find really, really helps with this approach is QuickType. What QuickType lets you do is define your types, your data structures, in one language, in this case, JSON schema, and then generate them in other languages. So in this case, C++ and TypeScript. This is really, really helpful, because I can change one part of my model, and then my compilers will scream at me if I've done something wrong and haven't updated it in either of those languages. This saves you a lot of manual work. In particular, serialization. It will generate all of the C++ serialization to and from JSON give you those functions for free. And so to talk about architecture with this approach, serialization is really important. And generally, the approach that I take with UIs now, and in particular when doing this C++ web hybrid approach, is just to think of the view as being the result of a function on the model. So take the entire state of your application and render it. That's all the view should be. And what it means is this is a bit more of a sort of a functional approach to programming, and it's a, an approach that's used a lot and pioneered in Clojure, I believe. And what this means is it can be really useful to define your application state as one giant data structure. So here we have the entire data structure, the entire state for that arpeggiator prototype. You can see it's not very big. In reality, I'd probably use some helper types for the notes and the sequences, but I put them all in here as literals. And what this means is when you need to take your state and send it to the UI, it's very simple 
to just serialize it and send the whole thing over. And this architecture, this is the, an architecture that I think works really well when you have this decoupled UI. And it's something that is well known in, say, the web world with things like React. Um, it's called a unidirectional data flow. And this is a very simplified model. There's a much more in-depth article and discussion about it linked at the bottom in a great C++ project called Lager, which is a sort of redux for C++. But what you have is the model, your application state, lives in C++. That is the source of truth. And then to render it to the UI, call a render function past the state, serialize the whole thing, send that over to the web view, which does its rendering. And then anytime you get some user interaction, say a mouse click or a field updated, send a message back, a typed message defined in QuickType, and send the data that's needed to perform an action. So for example, add note would be the message type, and then you can provide the data like the note number and the velocity, et cetera. When this is received by the model, we just update our state, and that's the only place that the state can be updated, so it's very easy to reason about, and this loop continues. Now there's one thing that I would add to this when using WebTech. Sometimes you have bits of state that don't belong to the model, they belong to the view, the sort of view state. Let's say how big a window is, or how which view is selected, or which button is highlighted. My approach to this is that you keep the view model in the JavaScript land, but you leverage the local storage API. So anytime you make a change to your view model, save it to local storage. Local storage is just a key value pair, and it can only save strings. So serialize your view state, save it as a string. Then when the page loads, you check local storage, see if there's anything there with your key, and load that into your view model. This is really, really helpful when you're doing live coding, as before, when you're iterating quickly, because every time you make a change in your code, the page will refresh, and now you can retrieve that view state, and you don't lose where you were. Final tool I'm going to recommend is this set of libraries, Thing Umbrella. This is a fantastic set of libraries developed by Carsten Schmidt, Carsten Schmidt and it covers almost everything you can think of. So not just UIs, but there's stuff for literate programming, for audio, and for graphics. A lot of his work comes out of doing generative de design or computational design. These are a great set of libraries. They're not a framework. These are things that you can pick piecemeal and use, and they work really well. The DOM stuff works really well with the architecture that I just described, where you just have state and you want to render it. Anyone who's familiar with WebTech might have been a little surprised by some of the syntax that was in the speed demo earlier because it's using these libraries. And they're really, really good for this approach because they have this declarative uh, approach. So you can just take this piece of state and pass the data to them and render them really easily. It's a real win, strongly recommend them. So in conclusion, talked about a lot, you might, not want to use web tech. I've, this talk has been sort of propaganda for why I like using web tech and why it's a really useful tool and I recommend it. But maybe you don't have the time to invest in it or maybe you just are very familiar with something else. You have your own secret source. I think the real takeaway from this talk should be do prototyping. Prototyping is such a powerful, important part of the process and is the best way of getting things right. And when you do prototyping, value your iteration time, build tools, bootstrap things, create stuff that will help you to work more quickly. It will be the key to creating the things you want to. Everything I have talked about or referenced today is up on this page, the link's there. Here's my contact information if you want to reach out. It's been really great getting to speak to you today and I uh, welcome any questions. So I've got a couple of questions here. I'm going to answer this first one live. Have you had any issues with latency between the web view and the C++ backend? That's not been a problem. Um, I have done, I've taken a very naive approach to a lot of the, the ways of doing this, 
which is just to serialize and send the data across. And it really hasn't been an issue. I can see that my webcam is really blown out at this point, but um, maybe not a lot I can do. Um, yeah, it hasn't been a problem. Using this for doing time updates and being able to show things very quickly, that doesn't tend to be a bottleneck. Serialization can be, um, you know, can take time, and I've found that using uh, the nloman library for JSON serialization in C++ is very effective for that. Um, but yeah, haven't really, haven't had that issue. There are, I should also mention, there are other approaches to serializing your data. Um, so using flat buffers or protocol buffers, a binary format that may be faster. There's also different types of communication. You can use WebSockets and again, this sort of depends on your use case. Second question here. Does this allow audio autoplay in WebView? Web audio API has restrictions unless used as an interaction cause policy update. Yeah. So um, just to give some context on this, you uh, can't do, you have to, the browsers and the OSs enforce a rule where the user has to interact with a web page before it can um, play any audio using the web audio API. That remains here because we're just beholden to the uh, the browsers. So that isn't an issue, but there are some tricks that are often deployed and that are useful for getting around this, such as um, having a function that on load means you, you put an event handler on every possible event, so keyboard or mouse events, so that as soon as the user interacts with it, um, you can uh, you can get a, uh, you can enable the audio. Sorry, just adjusting my webcam there. So, a uh, question from Matt Richardson. Are your prototypes internal only? At what point do you involve testers as part of your process? Good question. Um, prototyping for me began as an external thing. I had a few, bunch of ideas for things that I wanted in music technology that weren't out there and I was feeling a little bit stuck because I was thinking, well, if I want to put these out into the world, I've got to turn them into fully full-fledged products and plugins. Some of them also lived slightly outside the normal paradigm of plugin and door. And so what I decided was that I was going to build prototypes of them and share them for free on the internet, put the ideas out there. And the important thing was the ideas. And the great thing about doing that was I got some really good feedback and really good responses. It's actually what led to me getting this job here at Output. So I'm a big fan of making prototypes and putting them into the wild. It's an approach I adopted from Brett Victor, who shares lots of ideas and thinks that the most important thing you can do is share ideas and other people can build their own implementations on top of them. Um, but talking about the prototypes within the company, the yes, they start off internal. So we have a private web page, which is you know protected, which can be shared with anyone in the company and be able to try those out. And then involving testers, this usually begins with testing internally and trying things out between us on the team. And then we'll take it to uh, people within the company who have the kind of the appropriate skill levels for the the people we're targeting for that particular thing. So we have some people who maybe have never really made music with a computer before and we'll give it to them to try something out. Or we have some real experts. In this case, it was, let's take it to the sound designers and see if they, you know, what features do they want there. And then we do user testing with external participants, which is, you know, done with screen sharing um, during COVID and uh, trying things out and doing feedback and testing that way. 